Hey all, welcome to Shatrek. Hope you're having a great weekend. Um, and uh, it's uh, 19th of February 2022, a Saturday. And uh, I thought that um, uh, I would do a little bit about CRISPR Therapeutics, one of my favorite uh, companies in the CRISPR sector. Um, some things that all of us need to know about CRISPR, quick facts. Uh, and I'm also going to give some color to the company rather than just the numbers that we look at, the people who are running the company. So what I have done is I've gone through the net and found out some video clips. Uh, I have curated them and organized them in this um, video so that you can get a feel of the kind of people who are running uh, CRISPR therapeutics. Uh, in my books, they are absolutely the best in their field and uh, great human beings. Um, I hope you um, come to the same conclusion once you look at these video clippings. And uh, let's get started. This is a quick take on CRISPR therapeutics. Um, founded in November 2013 by Dr. Roger Novak and uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, CRISPR Therapeutics obtained its CRISPR-Cas9 license from uh, Emmanuel Charpentier. These are the founders uh, who got together to um, you know, create the company. Uh, Chad Cohen, Daniel Anderson, Matthew Porteous, Craig Mello, Emmanuel Charpentier, Roger Novak, and Sean Foy. So uh, I'm going to roll the montage on uh, selected clippings that I have taken uh, from across the internet. And uh, I'm also going to put the links down here uh, in the description so that if you are interested, you could, you could actually go there and see the entire video. Uh, I'll be putting some source credits here. Uh, but the objective is for you to get a feel of um, the people who are running the company. Uh, something that uh, I found very interesting to do. And then we'll uh, talk a little about the cash position of the company, et cetera, um, uh, more details. So let me roll the uh, reels for you. So Chad is the man. I am happily married and live in a little city called Manchester by the Sea, which is just north of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we have two um, boys. Our oldest is nine years old and is named Davy, and our youngest is um, just turned eight and his name is Ellery. Uh, my journey to where I'm at today began in Kansas, which is where I'm from. Um, I was born in Wichita, the big city, uh, which is not known for much except for a period of time and built most of the aircraft um, that uh, were flown throughout the United States. Um, as a kid, I did not care about academics um, at all. <laughs> I cared about playing outside. Um, I cared about sports. Um, I think I started caring about cars and then eventually girls. Um, so that was sort of like my childhood. And that ended uh, with me going to the University of Kansas, um, where actually I started pursuing what turned out to be a lifelong love, which was science. Um, I was a chemistry major there and then added on to that a biology uh, major. After graduating the University of Kansas, I went down to Texas where I had the pleasure of getting a PhD from a school known as UT Southwestern at Dallas. And I had very, I'd had very little knowledge about that school when I was applying to it. But at the time that I um, first came to UT Southwestern, they had five Nobel Prizes and then actually added another one since. So it's a really spectacular research university associated with a major hospital. And that's probably where um, my true love of research and science began because I had the opportunity to delve into, um, you know, research at the bench in a laboratory and not just sort of the dry esoteric stuff you learn in textbooks. And, you know, I think I, continued to feed the um, interests that I had in asking big questions about the world around me because it was amazing what you could do in biology at the time. You could ask a question, you could get an answer, you could then reinterrogate that, that same thing again and again, and it was a what they now term a virtuous cycle. Um, as I was uh, nearing the end of my PhD, I got very interested in stem cells and stem cell technologies. and I started looking around um, at all the laboratories that were working in a newly emerging field of human embryonic stem cells. And the reason I started looking at all of those was because I thought that the potential of what we could do with human embryonic stem cells was um, nearly limitless. And I got lucky again because it was so new, there were probably only five or six labs even in the world that were doing anything with it. So I didn't have to look that hard to try to find a laboratory to join. 
And I, uh, that led me on a journey to Harvard where I did my postdoctoral fellowship with a professor named Douglas Melton. And then as I tell people, um, Harvard was sort of like a black hole that sucked me in and I almost never left. Um, although very recently, as um, I was sharing with you, Henriette, I've now departed academia and am uh, leading a uh, small biotech company. But for 15 years, I was um, in the, a variety of roles here at Harvard, including uh, for a while uh, a professor at the college where I was teaching undergraduates for about a decade. Well, sure, thank you. So I've prepared a few slides, and I thought I'd talk about the sort of the area that I'm interested in. And broadly speaking, what I'm interested in is the materials for medicine, so the materials that we use to build our medical devices. And just to provide a little background, um, you know, historically, biomaterials for medical devices came from off-the-shelf materials. They were materials that were made for other applications. So, for example, the artificial heart, the doctors and scientists knew they needed something that was flexible and had a good flex life. And so what's, what's flexible? Well, a ladies' girdle. So in fact, the first artificial heart was made of the same material as a ladies' girdle, polyethylurethane. Uh, this trend really drove a lot of early device development. Vascular grafts, there was a surgeon in Texas who wanted something he could sew with. And so those first vascular grafts were made of Dacron, the same clothing material you might see as a shirt. Um, but you know, while this led to a lot of important advances, it became clear that these off-the-shelf materials were not perfect. So, for example, the artificial heart, uh, that material is nice and flexible, but um, biologically, when those materials interface with the body, they can lead to blood clots, and those blood clots can go to the brain. And so a real revolution in this field has been what we call the rational design of biomaterials. So now, instead of <clears throat> picking an existing material for a medical device, we think about how to build the right material for a given device and then make it and characterize it and and uh, get it to work. <clears throat> One of our speakers is Dr. Matthew Porteous. Matt Porteous is a professor of pediatrics paren stem cell transplantation there you go. at Stanford Medical School where he got both his MD and his PhD. Matt's roots in the area actually go deeper than that. I, I read your biography, and you and my children are all graduates of Gunn High School here in Palo Alto. Matt has worked at the intersection of stem cells and genetics for quite a while, works on trying to uh, treat or cure genetic diseases by modifying genes, and most relevant for this purpose, he is a member of the organizing committee of the International Summits on Human Gene Editing. The fine introduction. Thank you all um, for attending. And, uh, I haven't talked in front of a law school crowd before, but I suspect I don't need to. It's a pretty mixed crowd. I'm gonna say, I, but I'm going to say that it's probably not a bunch of shrinking violets, and there's going to be a lot of interesting questions. So in addition to what I told you, the other uh, uh, two other things I'd like to say is um, I my research lab over in the Loki Stem Cell Building is uh, focused on using the CRISPR technology to modify hematopoietic stem cells to cure serious genetic diseases like sickle cell anemia, bubble boy disease, and other diseases. And we're hoping to move uh, this research into clinical trials into patients uh, in the next year. And we're trying to do it. You know, we are doing it in a way that's above board, transparent, and through all the normal <laughs> regulatory agency. And again, it has nothing to do with the germline. The other point I would like to uh, make, in addition to filling in my CV, is I was also on the National Academy Study Committee that sort of put out a report between the two summits. Um, Valentine's Day 2017. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Dr. Craig Mello knows all about the power of RNA. The UMass Memorial researcher won a Nobel Prize for discovering a different way of using this genetic material to trick the body. In our case, we're making an interfering RNA, gets into the cell, finds the target RNA, mRNA, and turns it off. According to Mello, both messenger RNA and his interfering RNA, what he calls two sides of the same coin, are game changers. There's a tremendous...
this potential for developing therapies that really change the course of disease. Ever wonder why some people can eat sausage and bacon every day and still live a long and healthy life? One of the genes that was found in people like that is a mutation. Scientists are studying the idea of using silencing RNA to create that change, to lower the artery clogging cholesterol in the blood, potentially eliminating the need for millions of Americans to take statin drugs. But Mello also has his sights on diseases with no cure. What are you most excited about to watch for? I, I really want to make a difference in diseases like you mentioned like ALS and Alzheimer's. Dr. Mello believes the answers are out there but he's worried about stumbling blocks on the other end of the microscope. We need young people who have that sort of pioneering and, and, and entrepreneurial you know curiosity to go and look and help us make this exploration happen. Several years ago, the microbiologist Emmanuelle Charpentier and her team made a groundbreaking discovery. She figured out how bacteria defend themselves against invading viruses. She discovered that this natural mechanism can be used as a tool to modify genes. There was actually a call from Umeo University that was a, a new uh, laboratory focused on macrobiology, infectious diseases and molecular biology. So I knew that Umeo University was really strong in my field of research. I knew uh, already Umeo because I had uh, visited some colleagues of mine within the frame of, of a European network in the summer. But my interview took place in January uh, with, for sure, a lot of darkness, very cold weather, and uh, the, the first foot I put on, on the ground in Umeo was with the snow. So, you know, when you walk on the snow, it just grass, grass, grass. And then I said, this is, this is where I need to go. <laughs> this is where I need to be. I feel that I will be able to carry on this research. Um. Thanks for the nice introduction. I didn't understand too much, but uh, I hope um, you enjoyed it. Um, thanks uh, also for having me. So um, besides uh, my role at uh, CRISPR Therapeutics, I'm uh, also a member of European biotech boards simply to help foster innovation and breakthrough science in Europe. And we are now in the age of personalized medicine. The last point is biotech itself. So biotech, the way we build biotech companies today is very different than we did that, let's say, even 10 years ago. Um, that primarily probably applies currently to the US, but I'm hopeful that we will see that in Europe as well. And what I'm referring to is in particular that capital, access to capital is not necessarily rate limiting anymore. Um, and with that, we have access to really the very best people in the industry, and we can by now very clearly also compete with the pharma industry for the very best talent. One of our uh, subscribers wanted to know all the source of funding for CRISPR therapeutics, uh, how they get their money. Uh, so here is a compilation of uh, the source of funding. It's in two parts. The first part is grants, which is this slide, and I have another slide which talks about collaboration revenue. So the grants are totally worth 127 million, happening over five rounds, two rounds, or rather three rounds in 2015 and one in 2016, and the latest round was in 2020. And uh, uh, the latest round was uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for uh, some of uh, three million approximately. But the earlier rounds were much more substantial and involved the likes of Franklin Templeton Investments, uh, Bayer Global, uh, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, as well as uh, Celegene and uh, Versant Ventures. So that comes to a total of $127 million. And in terms of uh, collaboration revenue, uh, Vertex initially entered into a deal uh, worth $105 million uh, with CRISPR Therapeutics in 2015. And it was uh, broadly focused on uh, hemoglobinopathies. And um, uh, it was a wide range to talk about, by a broad scope, but then they na narrowed it down. And um, uh, the 105 million uh, consists of 30 million, which was for part ownership stake in CRISPR therapeutics. And um, it also involved getting a seat on the board so that they could observe uh, how uh, CRISPR therapeutics was uh, proceeding. They could have visibility into the operations. Um, 
And after the broad focus on uh, hemoglobinopathies uh, started off in 2015, by 2020, Vertex uh, had a much greater confidence and um, uh, CRISPR therapeutics had advanced uh, research to a good extent with CTX001 uh, that uh, Vertex was motivated to sign uh, and enhance a deal uh, by paying 900 million extra and agreed to, cost 60, uh, agreed to cover 60% of the costs uh, and uh, as well as uh, get 60% of the profits uh, through monetization of uh, CTX001. Uh, the earlier deal was uh, slightly inferior. It was for 50% of both costs and profits. So this is the uh, progression uh, of the collaboration between Vertex and CRISPR therapeutics. And the trend seems to be uh, deeper engagement, uh, more commitment, and uh, Vertex paying 900 million uh, into CRISPR therapeutics shows the uh, great confidence they have in how CRISPR therapeutics has been uh, delivering. And that's good for all of us CRISPR uh, shareholders to see uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, deal manifest. Let's look at the key metrics from the last earnings. Uh, so in the last earnings, um, we got uh, statistics about cash, revenue, R&D expenses, admin expenses, and net income. I think I presented this slide to you before, so I'm going to be pretty uh, quick. Uh, you can always go back and look at my previous video on CRISPR earnings. So the main focus here for me is the cash, uh, 2,379.10 uh, million in uh, FY 2021 as compared to 1690.3 million in uh, 2020. And a good chunk of that comes from the Vertex collaboration, uh, 931.10. So this slide um, shows uh, an extrapolation of uh, admin expenses and R&D expenses. So let me uh, first of all say that uh, only 2020 and 2021 data has come from CRISPR therapeutics. The rest are all extrapolations. For example, uh, R&D expenses grew almost 64% between 2020 to 2021. So I've used that uh, 64% uh, to find out what could be to project R&D expenses for 2022, 23, and 24. So it's all 64% jump. Uh, admin expenses were up around 2% or 2.4%. So I've used that to show uh, projection for admin expenses for 2022, 2023, and 2024. Uh, in reality, it may not probably happen like this. It could be better than this. Maybe R&D expenses could be less, uh, but um, uh, I have not taken into consideration uh, anything like uh, the possibility of uh, 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 synergies among uh, research projects and therefore reusability of some components or uh, use of the same personnel for common functions and thereby creating uh, a lot of uh, synergies. So those kind of things I have not done because I don't know how things are working within, but this is just a thought exercise, uh, assuming that if things went on the current trend, uh, what would be the situation for uh, CRISPR therapeutics? So um, unless they get uh, some cash funding uh, through either grants uh, or through a new collaboration, or maybe Vertex comes in for another candidate and uh, signs up and pays an advance to uh, CRISPR therapeutics, um, they might probably need uh, money beyond uh, 2023. Because as we can see, between 2022 and 2023, they would have used up almost uh, uh, 21,000 million. So uh, that's, that's a lot of money. If we just uh, go back and look at their cash position, they have uh, 23,079 uh, million uh, out here. So uh, between 2022 and 2023, they may potentially uh, use up most of it. So in 2024, they will definitely need funding if our assumptions hold correct. However, things could turn out much better than this or worse than this. Uh, we don't have that, um, uh, at least I don't have that uh, insight right now. So this was just a thought exercise. I'm not saying that this is what's going to happen, but it's just something that I wanted to uh, share with you. Um, and next, let us look at the pipeline. Let us look at the pipeline. So we don't have much color on uh, most of these CRISPR uh, therapeutics companies and uh, CRISPR stocks uh, in terms of pipeline. And also as lay persons and not, um, not scientists, uh, it's difficult for us to pick up uh, random news from different places and uh, get an idea of what is happening. So let us quickly take a look at the website uh, of the company, go into the pipeline page and see if there is anything new, uh, new updates in there, and, uh, and then we'll proceed further from there. So here is the uh, website of CRISPR Therapeutics, and uh, here uh, is the pipeline. 
So let's look at the first candidate, CTX001. This is what, what I'm more focused on because uh, I think this is in uh, quite an advanced stage. Let us look at what they have here. Um, core development and co-commercialization with Vertex. For more information, please click here. So it's just an infographic out here. We do not have, we do not have information uh, regarding what's happening with the trials. Now let's look at uh, CTX110. So if we go into CTX110 and click here, I've checked this um, out. Uh, this is um, allogenic uh, therapy and uh, we don't have any pipeline updates out here. Uh, let's go back and uh, look at CTX120. Uh, disruption and insertion, 100% owned by CRISPR Therapeutics. Click here. And uh, this is again uh, allogenic uh, uh, therapy. And uh, do we have any updates? We don't have any updates on uh, the trials out here. Uh, CTX130, disruption and insertion, 100% owned by CRISPR Therapeutics. There is, again, allogenic. There is no um, information about the clinical trials and uh, where it has uh, reached so far. So that was immuno-oncology. Now let us look at re regenerative medicine. Diabetes treatment, co-development, and uh, co-commercialization with viasite. So we don't have any more information out here. Uh, and then we have uh, four therapies in the research stage. They have not even come to IND enabling. Uh, so this is pretty, pretty early in the stage. So that's all uh, we have uh, uh, with regard to uh, the, the pipeline. And, um, and if we were to go and uh, look at the about, about Us section, and if we look at the leadership structure, uh, this gives you the actual management team, which is doing the day-to-day uh, uh, -day running of the business. Uh, the co-founders and scientific advisors, that uh, the pictures that I showed you before, they are all uh, uh, people who are at the higher level giving overall direction and guidance. But this is the management team, uh, Dr. Samarth Kulkarni and uh, the whole, uh, uh, whole, whole team out here, uh, all accomplished people. Let us look at the board of directors. Uh, again, Dr. Roger uh, Novak is on, out here. Uh, Dr. Samarth Kulkarni is in here. And uh, these are these are two main players out here back in the board of directors uh, suite. So uh, that's about uh, what I have here with me uh, for um, CRISPR Therapeutics. And uh, let us see if they have any news item talking about any of their uh, uh, clinical research or anything. February 15. Business update and reports fourth quarter 2020. That's all. And that we have already seen in our previous video. I have covered this earlier. So there is nothing new out here. So this is all we have. Um, so I hope this helps you to understand better uh, the company uh, that you have invested in. And um, let me do a very quick um, technical analysis on, on this company. A chart for the entire lifetime of CRISPR, CRISPR therapeutics, right from inception onwards. So as you can see here, um, the all-time low was 13.52. That was uh, probably in the month of inception of uh, uh, CRISPR therapeutics. Uh, so that is the very first candle that you have here. Each candle is one month. And right now, we are at 58.29. Yeah, 13.10 was the all-time low. 13.52 is the all-time low. And uh, right now, we are at uh, 58.28. And our MACD is absolutely bearish. And as you can see, the histograms are becoming bigger and bigger. That means the distance between the signal line and the MACD is increasing uh, in a negative way. Now, if you look at the RSI, the relative strength index, the momentum is falling down and it has got a lot of ways to go down further. So the thing that I would like to highlight out here is that any of us can say that from the day that CRISPR therapeutics was uh, incorporated until now, CRISPR therapeutics has made a whole lot of progress. It has got, uh, uh, it has got uh, deals tied up with Vertex. It got that 900 million infusion from Vertex. CTX001 is at an advanced stage, and we have got three more uh, uh, allogenic uh, candidates uh, in the trial stage. 
So uh, definitely, uh, when you go back to look at uh, 2015, when the company was formed and 2016, uh, we didn't have all those uh, uh, developments in place. And at that point of time, if you look at the highest valuation we had in 2016, it was 24.40. And then if we come to look at the valuation in 2018, uh, the highest it was around that time was 73.12. And right now we are at 58.29, below that. So uh, the question is, uh, has CRISPR therapeutics deteriorated? Have they failed in any clinical trials? The answer is no. Have they uh, failed to go beyond the broad uh, definition of research on uh, hemoglobinopathies? Uh, uh, no, they have gone beyond that. They have done uh, sickle cell anemia, uh, they have gone into the oncology side uh, and uh, they have also gone into diabetes. So uh, it's a wide range uh, and uh, uh, there has been progress. The staff count has also increased. Uh, the number of research uh, projects going on is also much higher in the pipeline. Uh, so um, uh, I do not see any r rational reason for CRISPR to be at 58.29 right now, except the fact that the entire uh, global uh, economy is under a lot of stress uh, due to the uh, great risks posed by the Ukraine-Russia um, uh, uh, conflict, uh, the elevated price of oil, uh, the high level of inflation, which is the result of uh, supply chain blockade and uh, excessive funding during the COVID pandemic uh, to keep the economy alive. So as a result, we are going to have interest rate hikes and uh, uh, tapering of the um, uh, Federal Reserve. So all of these are uh, weighing down on the market, and that's why it is looking like this. For a long-term investor, this should not be anything to worry about in my books. And my personal opinion is that I would continue to hold on to CRISPR therapeutics uh, for the long run. And I still have some cash left on the, uh, on the side for investment, but I'm going to wait because uh, I do not see uh, any of the risks getting resolved. The first um, uh, resolution of risk will be when Fed announces that they have completed their tapering. So that could give us a little bit of a relief because that is one less item to count in the risks, but everything else still, remain, still remains. So the next best news that we could have is that Omicron is no longer uh, affecting the economy and uh, all lockdowns and mandates have been lifted and people can move freely, companies can operate freely and people can travel freely uh, when all those things happen, that will be the second uh, level of unraveling of all the risks in the environment. In my opinion, this is the sequence of things. Somewhere in between that, we may have the Russia-Ukraine uh, standoff getting uh, resolved uh, without going to war and uh, things like that. Uh, so that will be the best case outcome that we can look at. And all these things should probably pay, play out in the next six to eight months time frame. So... Uh, so I would rather keep my money in the sidelines and wait uh, to see if the price can go down further, which uh, it seems like it would. Um, always in these kind of markets, there'll be uh, uh, intermediate jumps in between where it will seem like the market has turned around and gone up, but uh, very shortly it is likely to come back down. So we need to see consistent upward movement in order to start investing. That's my personal opinion. So that's all I have, my friends, uh, for uh, this Saturday. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful uh, weekend, and uh, I hope you liked this video. And if you did, please do not hesitate to put a like there. It will mean a lot to me. It will also help uh, other people uh, in YouTube discover this video and become a subscriber of our channel, which in turn will allow us to get uh, better uh, people to interview. And I can stop doing my monologue and have more variety out here, and uh, we can get more information from experts in the field. So uh, that's all I have to say. And if you're here for the first time, please do not hesitate to subscribe. It's absolutely free. Uh, be part of our uh, CRISPR community here and um, uh, see all the uh, new videos that I'll be putting in regarding to CRISPR. Thanks and have a great day. Bye for now.